Hello, welcome everyone to Lunch with Friends and Strangers here uh, at Carolina Public Humanities, which is actually my daughter's uh, ex uh, ex bedroom here. Uh, Carolina Public Humanities can be can be seen anywhere in this virtual world. Uh, my name is Max Orr. I know we have many friends out there in the audience, so it's a delight to be with you again. I'm Executive Director for Carolina Public Humanities, uh, the public outreach arm for the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And it's our job to take great scholarship uh, and bring it out to you in the community. And this is one of the funnest ways we can do it, lunch with friends and strangers, uh, informal conversations with good faculty and friends talking about really fascinating and interesting people. Uh, before we begin, I wanna thank our sponsors. Uh, uh, first, the North Carolina Yana Society has been doing incredible support for our uh, teachers workshops, um, especially in C the Cotton Merkin Group and Morgan Stanley also joining us and supporting our incredible outreach efforts to, uh, to Carolina's uh, K-12 teachers. We also would like to thank Carolina Meadows, a retirement community for uh, supporting both our public facing program and our teacher workshops. And finally, our great partner, uh, the General Alumni Association, who have always helped promoting our programs and our partners and a lot of our public offerings. And uh, we can drop information on all of those uh, 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 institutions and their services uh, there in the chat. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, so thank you to all of them. I also wanna thank, I'm mentioning Paul, I wanna thank Paul Bonici, who's always doing such fantastic work behind the scenes. Uh, and all of our friends at Carolina Public Humanities. This is uh, difficult to run a public program when you can't see the public, but you know, I'll take 2D any day over no engagement. So uh, here's how it works. First thing we need to do folks, uh, we'll get right to it. Uh, we want to uh, introduce our friend. So let me please invite my colleague from the history department uh, and good friend, Kathleen Duvall, welcome. And, uh, and now we also, uh, how are you doing today? I'm fine, how are you, Max? I'm doing okay. Are you ready for this uh, COVID thing to be over? <laughs> I'm so ready. Do, do I check the, the vaccine date every single day? Yes, I do. <laughs> oh, indeed, indeed. No, I, I know, and I'm tired of being blocked up. Uh, I, again, I feel a little bit. This is my daughter who now is uh, lives in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and this has become my office, and it's kind of strange to be trapped in a room that's you know, in your own house that you've never spent this much time in before, but <laughs> here we are. Uh, well, it's uh, thank you for joining us. You know, this is such a, a fun program because we get to talk about fascinating people. Um, and, and this is a person uh, that we're going to talk about today that I really didn't know anything about. Sometimes like, yeah, I've heard of this person. But, you know, like many people, I've heard of this person not as a person. Um, and that is today we're looking at Mantio. Um, so I, let's situate this first of all. I guess one. Let's get one thing out of the way. We are talking about a person and not a place. <laughs> That's <laughs> but right. There, but there is some. There is. A, there is a connection. So let's uh, let's situate Mantio as a person, and and where does Mantio fit in the in the broader scheme of um, Native American history and American history? Okay. So Mantio was born on what's now North Carolina's Outer Banks um, in the 16th century. Um, so quite a few centuries ago, he was uh, an explorer and a diplomat. And we don't always think of Native people in that era as being those things. We tend to think of those eras as the great era of exploration, um, but that we think of those explorers usually as Europeans. Um, but in fact, there were many Native explorers and, and many, many more Native diplomats um, with other native groups and also with Europeans. Yeah, as discovery goes them. both ways, right? Discovery goes both ways. And in fact, one of the things that I do most in my work is try to take words like exploration and discovery and, and, and you know, see if they're bigger than we thought they were. And so Manio was an explorer and a diplomat. Um, we don't have, have any... I should just before we go any further, I should say we don't have any pictures of Manio. Um, <laughs> this is an actor playing one of the um, the Roanoke Indians, as they're called in the Lost Colony play that maybe some of you have seen. Mm -hmm. um, and then the even the picture, the picture is of it could have been modeled on Manio himself, um, probably was modeled on one of the other leaders um, around Manio at the time, but but is from his era and his place. And it's, you know, it's remarkable because, you know, I, we also see, we, normally I put the dates of, we don't, we just have uh, this person, what's remarkable about them because they made an impact and we don't know much about other things, but we still, you know, have this name. One last thing about Mantio, it's, it's, 
when did that know do you know much about the town of mantio and when that was decided to name the town mantio it certainly is in the area he's from we'll get to that in our next slide absolutely yeah you will see um why that place is named for him exactly when it was named i don't know maybe somebody uh, when we get to the q a will know that um, i bet we have a lot of north carolinians so we're welcome and by the way i want to welcome of course remind everyone to use the q a button at the bottom there we'll get to questions at the end you know, and one final thing I just say about the name, interestingly enough, is that as you drive through the American landscape, you come across Native American names for places all the time. Um, but rarely do you come across a place that is named for a Native American. And, and I think that's really interesting. It sort of gives us some uh, perspective on the impact that he had for the people that, that named the town even, right? That there was something, and, and of course, a lot of times that is filtering out some of the bad stuff of the past to just sort of focus on, let's just put the name of the town and that's enough to honor the legacy of our Native American brothers and sisters, right? Right, and as we'll see, this the, the, there are reasons why the town was named for Manio and not for many of the other people of his time and place, which is that he was really seen as an ally of the colonists at Roanoke. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along, but, but that's yeah. the way he's seen. And so without having a, you know, a true sort of biographical record of how he was raised, you know, we, we need to do what historians do is we, we go with the, we go with what we know, right? Yeah, so yeah. what we do know is some of this context, right? And, and mm -hmm. I want to pull up uh, a little bit of the geographical context of the culture and place that uh, Mantia was from. So this is uh, clearly a European rendering, um, kind of looks relatively accurate in some ways, yeah. but uh, it's it's amazingly accurate, I think. Now, I should make sure everybody has realized that it's sideways, according to our view of North Carolina, right? Uh, uh, those are the Outer Banks on the bottom instead of where we usually see them on the on the right hand side. It's the perspective in, of encounter. Exactly. So you, this is European perspective, as you say, Max, coming toward um, this place that we now call home, but that many have called home at the time. And what, uh, so uh, it, do we have a sense of uh, how populated this area was? Do we have um, estimates? Yeah, so estimates are always terrible. So I'm not going to say any numbers, um, but it was very populated. This is a, this is a, um, this is a not wilderness, right? This is not an unpopulated place the way some Europeans, some English people will come to describe it in their own self-interest of taking it over. Um, it is a place that has many, many towns um, and also just lots of resource areas where, where people um, farm and uh, gather and fish here on the edges. And so one of the things that's important in this map to realize is that Europeans explore towns on the coast and to some extent up the rivers, the waterways, um, they don't explore the inland at all. So if it, the inland looks less populated, it's because Europeans haven't been there and made maps mm -hmm. there. It's not because people aren't there. I get it. And so we have some other, we have some other uh, examples here. Now this is uh, even closer and this is, um, this is where Mantio was from. This is where we encounter Mantio in this. Yeah, so, yeah, so he was from Croatoan. Uh, basically what's Hatteras Island right now. Um, and his people were from there. His mother, it was, uh, most leaders, these are, so just to back up a moment, um, this is an Algonquin region here on the coast. So many different people speaking different languages, um, but on the coast, they are all under the broad language group Algonquin. Algonquin stretch from what's now north, uh, sorry, southeastern Canada um, down yeah. To a little bit south of here. I know that the Native Americans in uh, Vermont, where I'm from, were uh, Algonquin. You're right, exactly. So it's like saying they're Romance language speakers yeah. or something. It doesn't mean much beyond li linguistically. Um, but uh, his particular people were Croatoan, and his what I was sort of leading toward and got myself off track with the language was his mother was a political and religious leader among the Croatoans, um, which was pretty unusual among. Algonquins, the public leaders were usually men. Women had other kinds of leadership roles, um, but his mother was, was uh, one of the most important leaders of Croat uh, Croatoan. This whole region was called Osamokamuk, um, mm -hmm. which had really basically stretched between the Albemarle Sound and the Pamlico River, um, these nearby at islands and outer banks. Uh, lots of different polities were involved in it. Um, and actually, if you could go back to the the close-up yeah, sure. for just one moment. Oh, no I'll worries. point Here out a town I'm going to talk about later. Yes. 
Sorry. <laughs> no, I, no, 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 no. I want to make sure I, we want to see big pictures of our guests, but we also want to see, uh, see the details here. <laughs> Maybe that's my ulterior motive. I don't want my face too big. Um, but this, this third, so you can see Roanoke Island here. Roanoke yeah. Island is basically a fishing post. Um, it's not a place that a lot of people live on or live on permanently. Um, and then the, the, the third thing that I've circled there, the, um, the Dasamunkipuk, uh, that is the, probably the, it is the major town in the region. And that's okay. where a leader named Wangina had his main town. The Croatoans are a pretty small society relative in this region, and they're closely allied with Wangina um, and his towns around there, which include that capital, if you will, um, at Dasamunkipuk. Um, uh, so that'll be important in the story. So, so, and then this, this okay. is a, this is a community that is obviously, you know, they're pretty close. They're all, everybody is in contact. There's commerce here. There might be some political divisions of some sense, but this is a shared sort of culture if you, in this region. And, and, yeah, so, and yeah. with, webs, with webs of interconnectivity. And trade. Yeah, that's exactly right. Conflict? And it's hard to we can't always put our labels on those, you know, yeah. these nations are they, it, it's hard, but yeah. there's they're some, they're definitely polities. They're very structured polities. They're nations in some cases. Um, and, but there are also wars. So there's some wars, go, there had been a war until pretty, re, by the time the English come, there'd been a war going on between the allied Croatoans and Wangina's people against people to their south. That has been pretty much healed by the time the English get there, but there's a huge war going on with people just to their north. Okay, really interesting. So it's, uh, you know, this, so this is an, an area where it's almost like this sound, you know, that the, has, has creates a, an area that just by its geography is creates allegiances by necessity and need and alliances with others. And, you know, like everything, every culture is faced with competition for resources and other sources of conflict, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And then they also have trade connections to interior peoples leading all the way to the mountains and beyond. Um, and so that's some source of both alliance and conflict as well there. And, it's getting and, and resources from farther inland. And we certainly know that uh, the connections uh, uh, in American Indian societies are really quite extensive. I mean, right, right. So that. they go, then that gets them to trade networks that pick up to copper from the Great Lakes and just all over the continent. Right? I, just as an aside, I would assume that this, you know, great language group that connects, you know, this is, this is facilitates these types of exchanges, right? You can have an exchange, you know, you, I mean, just throwing this out, you can get maple syrup from, uh, or maple sugar mm -hmm. from Canada if you want, you know, because of this, uh, this connected uh, culture. That's right. But as we know from, for example, romance languages, people who are in the same language group can also be bitter enemies. Right? Oh, so, sure. And I should mention there are also Iroquoian speakers inland who are part of important trade work networks too. Okay, fantastic. Well, I, I was really, we looked at this a little bit uh, together in the, in the preliminary and just getting a sense of the, uh, the type of uh, life that they're leading in the, the, the economy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you had mentioned that this area was really a fishing area. Yeah, particularly, I mean, obviously all of the Outer Banks are, but Roanoke itself was really just kind of a temporary fishing post. People, people probably didn't live there permanently. It's not a, it's not a place for agriculture at all. And, and I, it's important to stress, to stress that for many of people and all of these people, even the coastal people, agriculture is um, probably what they eat most. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously there's a lot of seafood for those right on the coast, um, but these are agricultural societies as well. Um, but this of course is a picture of fishing. Uh, yeah. And I love this picture. This is uh, an, an engraving that was made in Europe. It's based on a John White watercolor, which, which some of our listeners may have, um, may have seen. And you can just see this, uh, the English get here and they're like, there are fish everywhere. They, they really, they see, I mean, English people are able to say, to describe the place as a wilderness, which is completely wrong, but also to see its great bounty. But what they often miss is the fact that these are cultivated resource bases, right? That yeah. um, this, you, you can see from the, the little, the little fences, the weirs yeah. that they're using, um, that these are, these fish aren't here by accident. The fish have been, um, you know, this is, this is not, this is not 21st century aquaculture, yeah, but it's somewhere between that and wild fishing, right? 
That's really interesting. So this this is some sort of like a wicker beer or something like that. Yeah, that, or exactly. Beer or something you have there. Fish oh, swim in and they can't swim out. <laughs> and, you know, I did do a little. I as we talk, we did a little close up of it here, so we could see them uh, in the boat. And uh, and I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask the people to to weigh in on the chat. We were wondering just why they were making a fire, and and uh, I suggested that it was to attract the fish up to the surface so that you could get them. With but the light, we, right? Was what people, we don't know for sure, but yeah, it is a fascinating yeah. picture. And um, am I am I seeing a uh, uh, multiple gender? I mean, is this a woman in the middle here? And men, I think are they that's right. I think the men are, you know, are, are pulling the boat along the, uh, you know, um, and then the the women are. So it's possible they are, um, you know, opening oyster shells or I, I yeah. don't know they're I'm don't, sure there are listeners who know more about fish on the outer banks than I do or they're, they're doing some kind of processing there in the boat that's also possible all I know about fishing is just waiting around um <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's all I got to offer on that so and, and I should say John White's accounts of this are very long so it's possible that if I, if I went back to that I would find more you know if we wanted to make this a research project there there probably is more evidence we could use from the 16th century as well as today I don't want to make it a research project. I want to go on a fishing trip, Kathleen. So <laughs> that's, that's the kind of research job, research field trip. That's the best kind of research. Trip. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, and again, so we, we see we, what we're seeing here is we see this. We see this. Uh, the Europeans notice a place of plenty. They see mm -hmm. people engaged in the, you know, harvesting of these resources. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also aware of of this more sort of um, and again, I, we throw all these civilizational ideas out there. You know, having studied colonialism, we know that you know you're only impressed if you see monumental uh, architecture or written language. You know that these are the markers by which mm -hmm. you know Europeans considered civilization. Mm -hmm. But they certainly come across political organization mm -hmm. and community organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what can you tell us about the town of Sakota? Uh, so this is not Manio's town. We don't have a picture mm -hmm. of Manio's town. This is. Um, this is a bit more inland, barely more inland, is possibly a little more agricultural than, than Manio's town would have been, but still gives us a good idea of, of what a town in this region looked like. Um, this, is on, uh, this is on the Pamlico River, just, um, just a little ways away. This is on the left is John White's watercolor of it, and then on the right is the, uh, the, the engraving that was made in Europe of it. Um, and you can see that sort of, I mean, they, the artists have made a point of letting you see what's going on in native village kind of in a compact way. And, and I should say, based on you know, what we were just saying, Europeans, while they do over time develop this idea of primitiveness and everything, these very earliest European explorers really don't stress that. They yeah. see complexity and they actually draw it and write it the way it is. And so, and so in some ways, these 16th century accounts are better, or I think a more yeah. accurate than what you might get in the, in well, the late 18th or 19th century. I, I studied I studied colonialism in the 19th century. Right, of course like you old do. scientific racism. Yes, and... you study the height of the horrible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a really interesting point to talk about. You know, we also, um, it, it gives us this insight into the possibilities, right? The possibility of a different type of relationship, right? When we, when we don't just paste those ideas that are, you know, real ideas and so damaging, you know, and we yeah. see the damage that they've done, you know, throughout the global south. Um, but there's a possibility here. And, and I think that speaks to Mantio's story, right? That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so right. they see the complexity of society. And I, I'm going to show that one. It's just too great a picture to take down, by the way. I'm going to pull it back up. They see the complexity of society. Mm -hmm. They see all sorts of activities. Mm -hmm. um, right. They see, you know, some sort of organization. I, uh, again, you know, I, I, I don't want to paste sort of later conceptions, but they're seeing organized units of houses as opposed to sort of just communal, right. you know, there be, again, as some sense that this can be, this could be understood by a European population. That's right. And it's important to remember that European, like, so these are probably, you could call these long houses, right? They house a large extended family. They are not mm -hmm. small houses. Um, but that, Lots of Europeans lived that way at the time with a central fire, no chimney, yep. animals living with them, which they didn't in this, this village. They didn't have domestic livestock living in the houses. Um, they didn't have domestic livestock at all to decide whether to live with, with them in a house the way Europeans did. Um, Europeans and Native North Carolinians, you know, common Europeans and Native North Carolinians don't live that differently in the 16th century. 
you know, it's really interesting too. you know, you think about the, you know, this, you know, uh, the idea of a country going out, you know, England going out and discovering, but really England is, is a series of local localities, you know, and, and, and in this time people are living in village life and, you know, they're, they're associating themselves as a member of X parish or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as a, so I, it, again, I do think that it's really powerful that this would be the image that, you know, some English would see and see themselves in it. Perhaps. Yeah, I think that's right. A town with farming, farming close in, farming farther out, um, gathering resources outside, a central religious space, a central feasting space, um, and houses, as you were saying. It's, it's not that different from a European village. Well, here's a, here's a challenging question then. Does that influence people to want to come to America? And, and because it's kind of already a place where we've seen thriving and we could, you know, we could do this just easily. And we know that it was not easy to come right. to America, obviously, when we look at Roanoke, right? It was not easy to come to America, but did it have some effect to portray this side of Native American life, as opposed to saying this is a land of just savagery and primitiveness and open yeah. top of the rasa? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, the sort of, you know, advertisers did not want to portray it as a dangerous place. That's definitely true. Um, and then when Europeans got here, they often did settle on, you know, by force or by invitation, settle on lands that Native, Native women were the farmers in most of these societies, that Native women had already prepared and farmed themselves. Um, so, you know, whether they chose it because of that or not, it certainly made things easier for early settlements. Um, very, very interesting. So let's bring Mantio into the historical okay, record. Okay, okay. Right. <laughs> so I, what's our first mention? Where do we where do we meet Mantio okay, so, um, in the yeah. in the written evidence, if you yeah, will? Yeah. So the English come, they land on 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 Roanoke. Um, they were by far not the first Europeans that Manio's people had seen. There have been various explorers, shipwrecks, mostly Spanish, but not all Spanish. Um, um, when Jaina, this leader of, of generally over much of Osamokamok, this huge region, he sent Manio um, to basically be a diplomat with these new English people. Um, he sent two people um, who would go to London with these first English ships when they returned to, to England. Just, I, when he sent Mantio, when the chief sent Mantio to be a sort of, you know, a diplomat with him, was he, did he expect Mantio to go to England? Uh, yeah, by the time, yeah, yeah. He, I mean, maybe not the first moment, but but there were several diplomats that he sent um, and the two that got chosen, probably by Wangina himself, by the leader, were Manio um, and also Wanchis. Um, who uh, was a man, Manio, we don't know how old Manio was. I'm guessing he was probably 20, 25. He's definitely a young leader. I mean, it's, uh, his mother is, is a really important leader. So he's the generation below that. Um, Wanchis is younger. Wanchis actually just means boy. Um, so that was his nickname, right? So he presumably yeah. was young. Um, and uh, so, so those are the two men who were sent to return um, with the English to England and, and basically it's the explorers and diplomats themselves. So these are not the first Native Americans sent back to European countries. And we certainly know some devastating and horrific stories mm -hmm. of Christopher Columbus sending sort of exhibits almost of, but this is a different type of, of trip. Exactly right. So it's very, very important to separate the many Native people who were kidnapped and then, you know, either as you were saying, you know, sort of shown off in Europe or just simply enslaved um, versus a diplomat, like these two men clearly were, and there were lots of these as well, who chose and their people chose, they're representing their people, chose to go to Europe and explore and, uh, and negotiate and come back as, as Manio and Wanchis did. And was it, was, it a, um, was it seen the same way on both sides? Were the English, Take, you know, did, did they see, did they value the mission that Mantia was on and say, this is, yeah, this is a legitimate thing that polities do with each other? Yes. And I think it's really important to understand that, right? The English see uh, the Croatoans and the larger groups in Osamokamuk as being polities they need to negotiate with. Um, 
Yeah, right. So, so and now I should back. I should pause for just one second and say yeah. we only have any of this from the Europeans' point of view, right? We our written documents are all theirs. So everything we have from the native point of view is either oral history that survived, stories that have survived about them. We're just reading those documents and and our, also archaeology to try to understand it from um, from native peoples. What made it, native people's perspectives might have been on these things based on their actions and their words that made it into those European yeah, documents. Sure. But from everything we can tell, this was seen on both sides as a diplomatic um, reason. You know, diplomatic, yeah. their diplomatic reasons by behind this trope. And and if there's only one documenter of this whole, uh, you know, this whole exchange, and they're making this clear that this is an exchange of equals, then we can take that at face value they have they if they didn't consider <laughs> them as equals, if they didn't consider them as equals you wouldn't have to portray it as such and you would be able to change the narrative around what was just going on there yeah that's right and, and i should say we have multiple european accounts of it so at least we can at least we can sort of check them off against each other and yeah and and so they end up in you know uh in this place durham house yes. uh, so, so i said the common europeans live um similar to manio's people um <laughs> Sir Walter Raleigh did not live like common Europeans. This is Sir Walter Raleigh's house. It had previously been Anne Boleyn's house when she was a favorite temporarily of Henry VIII. Not too far in the past. <laughs> right, not too far in the past. Yeah, so this is where Manio and Wanchis stay for most of their time when they're in England. How long do they stay in England? It's quite a few months. They come back in, in, seven, in, in 1585. Yeah, and let's get the years on this. So in 1585, um, so uh, the Roanoke colony is established. In 1580, well, it, it's going a bit far to call it a colony at this point because yeah. all the English people went back with Manio and Wanchis. They didn't leave any English people. So, um, so you need so, to fix my ignorance. What's the? How do we the the, the lost colony? Where does it? Where does it? Yeah, the lost colony is, is two this? trips in the future. Okay, so okay. so this is. Um, I think it was two two ships come in, in 1584, meet um, native people, bring back Manio and Juan Cheese, and and now they're they're here in England through 1585. But the idea, Sir Walter Raleigh is behind all this. The idea is that the first was an exploring mission, um, and that the second, in the, which they'll return with Manio and Juan Cheese, will be a um, a permanent colony. Or at I least a permanent trading post. So in a way, you know, it really was this diplomatic sort of setting the setting the stage because they are going to try to go and establish a permanent base here in the right. place. Is Manny aware of that? Yeah, I mean, he knows he's going to come back, right? <laughs> so yeah. he knows some English people are going to come back. He's clearly... And, and he is there, you know, I say he's there to explore, but he's really also there to negotiate trade. And so in... There, you know, you, it's important, you know, when I call him an explorer and somebody who's who's establishing trade, you know, he doesn't have the kind of conquest motivations that you might see in, in many a European explorer. But some of his, his other motivations are the same. He's working for his people in the same way that, say, Columbus was working for the, his king and queen, right? He is um, there to establish permanent trade, um, which will give the Croatoans um, and, and the people of Osamokamuk some, um, you know, some... Uh, 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 some trade resources uh, that nobody else has in the region. Um, they absolutely know by this time what Europeans have because of these previous explorers and shipwrecks. So, um, yeah, it's a trade mission and a diplomatic mission. That and, you know, and he tends to return. Pull up this map here. You know, there's uh, Durham House. He certainly it just gives you a sense of the. You know, London's a big place with a lot of commerce and yeah. a lot of uh, and a lot of um, opportunities if you wanted to get into trade. Do we have any sense of Mantio's impressions of English culture, of the things that he might have uh, in, been particularly been intrigued by or engaged with? Yeah, so he didn't, we know that he told people what he thought, but he didn't tell the people who were writing anything down, right? So he went home and told his people lots of things. And so what we have to do is kind of look at what London actually was like at the time and imagine what he might have said based on that. Um, so London by this point has, by the 1580s, has recovered from the Black Death. Its population is climbing and climbing. It is a very crowded place. This, uh, you can sort of see the city walls here in the middle. 
um, and the areas right around. That area is so dense. There are probably 150,000 people um, there, by, you know, just, just right in the walls and right around mm -hmm. by this period. Um, and that, that is the same population density as Manhattan today. Yeah. And no skyscrapers, right? Everybody's living close to the ground. So the streets are crowded and filthy. Um, there's so much poverty that Mania would never have seen any of this kind of crowding urban poverty. That, that stuff is unknown in, uh, in his society that, yeah. that they have sanitation problems that are not a problem in, uh, in native North Carolina. Um, it, I mean, there's some, it, it doesn't take much inferring to think he would be shocked at some of the human um, conditions. So, you know, again, this is, uh, this reminds me somewhat of the, you know, colonial soldiers coming to France in World War One and saying, oh, wait, there are poor people in France too who don't like the government or, you know, did he get some sense of, I mean, we have this projection of power. I mean, certainly the, the, the ships that the Europeans come on, there's a, there are technologies that the that the Native Americans are not familiar with, and it's a projection of some power. Yeah, it intrigues Mancio to want to trade with these people who are powerful and whatnot, mm -hmm. and then to come and see this type of society. I, really, I mean, again, I wish we had, you know, the firsthand accounts, but I think the supposition could be maybe, you know, maybe it's not all it's cut up to be, cut out to be. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. You can say this is, you know, in somewhat. Yeah. This is a maybe the trade, you know, the trade, the ships, the, um, the wealth that he sees in Raleigh's house are um, greater than his people had thought it would be. Um, and yet some of, yeah, the downside of, of like becoming that kind of people must have been also clear. Um, and maybe also the danger of joining with like the both advantages and dis possible disadvantages of having an ally like this which yeah. will become clear as more European soldiers, more English soldiers come to Manio's homeland. Um, For sure. So they go, you know, of course they go, they go back. Um, yeah. It's only, a, it's all you say, it's only a few months. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one of the uh, things that he does that we haven't talked about yet is, is language. He uh, and Wan Chi's both start learning English when they're on the ship. There are just lots of soldiers. There, there's lots of, of writing from the ships talking about how, all the soldiers were talking English and also learning their, you know, Manio and Juan Chis's Algonquin from mm -hmm. them. Um, so lots of language conversations. Manio, by the time, by the return journey, um, he is described as speaking English. So, so he learns English over the course of this trip. And, and there's some sort of like linguistic exercise uh, in. Yeah. yeah. So this is a, a document that comes. It was it was made by Manio. And Juan Chis together with um, with Thomas Harriet. So Thomas Harriet is a is a scientist, a 16th century scientist, um, which means a broad, you know, broadly yeah. interested in lots of things. Philosopher um, who does a lot of things. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so he Raleigh has chosen him to go on this second trip uh, to Roanoke, and so he spends some of those months while um, the young men are in Durham House in London. Um, working on this, this is this is basically a, an orthography, um, mm -hmm. which was like the very beginnings of a dictionary and pronunciation guide um, for the Algonquin that that Manio speaks. Now we, we actually don't know for sure that Manio and uh, and Wanchi speak exactly the same language. Wanchi is actually from uh, Wenjina's um, town and people, probably so, and not he's not pro. pro um, Manio is from Croat Croatian. Yeah. Um, uh, one cheese is not right. So they're both Algonquin, but they might be different language or dialect. Right. I mean, even they're within probably that pretty small close area. Even yeah. Right. So, so they're not as far apart as as uh, your um, Algonquin peoples far in the northeast might have been, but uh, they might have been exactly. But they're close enough for for Thomas Harriet, I think. Um, and so and, I'm going to pull in closer in this. Yeah, I, pull in I a little closer. Bit of a detail here. So, are we looking at um, the attempt to create uh, sort of letters that that you know, equal sounds, or is this, you know, a, a so is this a phonetic attempt? Are they using exactly? That's using exactly right. Because if you think about it, if I'm trying so to this see. is for English speakers. And so if yeah. you think about it, if you're an English speaker, you're trying to learn a language that you've never heard spoken, um, or, or you know, because Harriet wants to share this with other people. Um, you have pronunciation is key, right? Yeah. And so he has to figure out ways to describe 
succinctly how to pronounce things. Um, so that's that's what they're trying to do here. It's very hard to read, but <laughs> yeah, let's, I'm trying. I'm trying I'm, this it. reminds me of reading in the archives. I know. It's <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so, uh, do we have any sense of how um, useful this document was for later communications between uh, Europeans and the peoples of this uh, of this region? Yeah, I mean, much more useful is. Manio himself, he becomes the most important interpreter between the English and the Carolina Algonquins um, and uh, then and other people who also, but it, it turns out that immersion is a better way of learning it than reading Harriet's um, and what they wrote down. It's still true, folks. <laughs> um, you know, so this he goes back. So he does go back. This we have a picture here of the. This is uh, we assume the ship that he goes back to. Uh, yeah. So they they sail back. There are seven ships that sail back. This is the flagship. So we don't know for sure he was on this one, but he could have been this, one of the people standing there. It, this is not the colonizing trip at this point. For for this is, is the. This? So there will be three trips, three major trips. The first exploring one. Um, the second one, this one that Manio goes home on, which is still for the on the English side, it's still all men. It's 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 basically a trading and exploring post. Um, and then there will be a third one that is um, uh, that is the lost the one that becomes the lost colony that includes women and children. So so when he goes back, we still have contact with Mantio. We st does Mantio still um, is he is he still on the historical record in the time yeah. after his uh, his return from? Uh, yeah, he uh, is. He stays in. He stays at Roanoke with the English um, and is he's sort of their diplomat in residence, the, the ambassador to them, if you will. They they probably they're kind of too small of a collection of people to really preserve the term ambassador to them. But he he is in residence there, right? He stays there as the interpreter um, and the permanent diplomat there. And so, but at the same time, Juan Chis, who has been parallel with him in the story thus far, leaves. And it's possible that the stories that Manio and Juan Chis tell about England are different from each other, to go back to that question you asked before. It's possible, some historians have guessed that while Manio says, this is gonna be worth it, this is a good people to be allied with, we can make this work. Juan Chis says, no, they're dangerous, we should kill them and make sure they never come back. Now. There has been probably a tendency to over dichotomize them to make Manio the good guy from yep. the English perspective and the later North Carolina, uh, you know, growth of North Carolina perspective, and want Cheese to be the bad guy, the one who opposes um, the English. The Lost Colony play does this not in good and bad so much as, but still makes them very different in what they decide. Um, given what we know of native diplomacy, it's just it's at least as likely that they were actually assigned these roles that Manio was told by Wingina, you stay at Roanoke and you befriend them and you be the interpreter and the diplomat and Juan Chis, you stay with me and you'll guide the military effort against them if we need to go to that. Um, well, you know, every diplomat is a spy, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> if you think the diplomat is like the guy you won over, which they totally do, yeah, you're probably fooling yourself. But that gets back to your earliest question about why the town of Manio is named for Manio um, and not Juan Chis. So, so um, of course, you know, it makes all of us wonder about, you know, the, you know, the North Carolina mythology of the lost colony. And does Mancio figure into that story at all? Was Mancio the one that saved them and took them away? Or yeah, so it's a right, exactly. He he's in the whole rest of the story, right? So it's a long and complicated story. I'll, I'll sort of cut the middle a little bit. Sure. Um, Mancio basically. The next thing that the next major thing that happens is that Ralph Lane, who's left in command at Roanoke, um, basically Roanoke is it's kind of a trap. Like you cannot, as you you can't grow food there really. I mean, not enough. You can't grow much food there. It's not an agricultural place. Um, so he's complete. The English are completely dependent on on Chief Wingina bringing them food. Um, Lane decide knows the the. the Relationships getting worse and worse. Lane knows he's completely dependent. And so he gets Manio um, to lead him on an exploration journey. And Wangina agrees to it. Wangina sends several other 
um, of his people to be along on this expedition, including his own uh, his own daughter in law. Um, but uh, so Manio is basically leading this expedition north. Um, the English end up barely getting out alive. At some point, they have to kill their dogs and have to eat them because they have no food. Um, it's possible that this whole thing was a trap, that they were supposed to go out there and starve or, or get killed by this. I remember I said this, the people of Osamokamuk are, are fighting the next um, peoples to the north. It's possible that, that they hope that they would just get killed off in this. Um, put them in harm's way, if you will. or Put them in harm's way, exactly. Yeah. They barely managed to straggle back to Roanoke. Um, at one point, uh, and this, this gets at Manio's role as a translator, um, uh, Lane is talking to a, a local who describes for him Wasador, and Manio says, he basically, he speaks enough English at this time, he's able to give a, a longer translation to, uh, to Lane. He says, I'm going to translate it as copper, but I'm also going to tell you we don't have words for gold and silver. And of course, Lane thinks that's a maid. Like, oh, well, then it must be either gold or he writes, Lane writes, it's probably either gold or silver or some metal we've never heard of that has amazing yeah. properties. Yeah, vibranium or. <laughs> yes, exactly. If he'd had the ionium sort of idea in his head, he would have made up a lanium, maybe. <laughs> yes. Wow, that's fascinating. So, uh, again, you know, the lost colony happens. We know that. Yeah. And, and, I assume that is when Mantio leaves the historical record. Like, yeah. After so, so what happens is, is so the, um, it, 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 so those English decide to leave. Like things get too dangerous. Sir Francis Drake comes by. They go on Drake's ship, and Manio goes with them. So Manio goes to England again a second time. Then Manio comes back with what becomes the lost colony, John White and his okay, family. Okay, so he was on that second journey. At, how long did he spend in England the second time? Uh, uh, that's, oh, I've got my, I, I got my dates uh, confused now, but there is, a, yeah, there's this second trip. Um, it, it's not very long. It is, it's a similar length trip, um, but, but long enough to get, uh, it's a, I mean, it's a, in both cases, in both trips, there's a lot of sort of getting the supplies together, getting the funding together. Yeah. Um, so they do all that. They get back on ships. Um, he immediately takes John White, who's the leader of, of this last expedition um, and colony, um, to meet his mother, right, to try to patch up some things that had gone wrong with, with Ralph Lane in the region. And really, it seems that Manio and his mother and, and their allies really want a second chance for the English. So like this John White colony, it's different. It's families. They really want to settle in this region and be an ally of us and not the Ralph Lane kind of military um, men only um, yeah. danger that, that they had posed. Um, but it doesn't work out. Um, uh, it, along the way, Manny was baptized Christian. That's part of, of why um, sort of, he seems really like, yeah. uh, like the ally of the English, but he's clearly also still conducting diplomacy for his own people. It's not he's, yeah. he's stopped being who he was before. Is it clear that, uh, is it clear that um, he understood the exclusivity of Christian worship? Absolutely even? not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, no, basically, there are almost no native people in this era who think that if you become Christian, you have to give up your former beliefs and practices because that is not the way their religion works. Their religion, as you say, is inclusivist. That it, sounds like a good idea. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea and we're gonna fold it in. If it contradicts yeah. us, something, we'll deal with the contradiction, but we won't, uh, yeah. we don't have to throw out the, the old baby when you get the, well, that's not a good metaphor, but anyway. Um, so the, so, so anyway, the lost colony yeah. has him as a resource yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, the lost colony would not have survived as long as it did without him. And, and so that is one of the reasons the town is named for him. It really, he really is tremendously important into this diplomacy. Um, and then, of course, John White goes back to get more supplies. And we don't know what happens to the lost colony after that. But they did write on the tree, as everybody yeah. knows, right? Croatoan. And in John White's writings, it's very clear they had set up, the English that he left there had set up a signal system. And it was right on a tree what you're doing and if you had to leave in an emergency situation he had a symbol you were supposed to put above it and they didn't put that symbol they so he infers wow. he isn't even really panicked that he can't find them he's he knows they didn't really take much time to look he's on another a ship that doesn't really let him get off for very long he 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 sees that they're not at roanoke but he doesn't do he can't he can't explore any farther um, and they've written Croatoan on, you know, in different ways on three different places. 
no emergency symbols. And white is sure, Manio took them home, right? Manio took them to Croatoan to take care of them. Now, from Croatoan, Hatteras Island, you can see ships coming. So it seems that if they really were there, um, Manio and the others would have, would have you know, make signal yeah. to the ships to stop. So, but it's possible they had gone inland. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so we hear the possibilities. Um, they were massacred. Mm -hmm. uh, they, mm -hmm. on their own, went inland. They merged with uh, Native American society. Mm -hmm. Based on your understanding of the culture, and I know it's still a mystery, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, were there examples of sort of large scale massacres that that could have been uh, the, the case? Yeah. Um, so, so all of them could be possibility. Are they all equally plausible? No, I would say the least likely is that they went off somewhere on their own because there, there is no on your own here, right? Um, you might go to a different people and take refuge there, but there's no, there's no empty space, right? So if they went north, they would be, you know, giving up on the people of Osamokamuk and joining with their enemies or, you know, what I think is probably the most likely is they did go to Cro uh, Croatoan the way they said they would. And Manio and his people perhaps had to, because at the same time, there are lots of, um, there are many kidnapping attempts by Spanish and other ships on the Outer Banks um, to take people into slavery. It is very possible that people stopped living on the Outer Banks. I'm, I'm, it's, it's not just possible, it's, it's definite that people stopped living yeah. on the Outer Banks. Um, and so it's possible that there was an intentional move that included the sort of leftover English as part of their community um, that then moved inland. Also, there's a long, long tradition among many Native peoples of North America of adopting not only individuals, but also groups. And so the English might have continued to have their own town that was subordinate under either the, the Croatoans or Wangina's people um, or other another Native group in the region. But we certainly, I mean, you know, we, we certainly know that whatever the result was did not result in a continued English presence or even, you know, even the sense that, oh, look, there are a lot of people that look like they're half English here. Yeah, right, uh, right. So it seems like, you know, it was, a, we know from Jamestown, right? We know how difficult this was for Europeans yeah. to do anyway. So uh, in, in the most desperate situations, perhaps there were a few people left. Right, right, right. After, right. so we just don't know. But that's, of course, it seems like it would make a great play. Someone should get around to writing that play sometime. Um, <laughs> so, so again, we're, we're coming to the end here. I want to remind folks to please give us questions in the Q and A. Um, so, this is where Mantio leaves the historical record and becomes legendary. And are there talks that Mantio did all of this for them? Like Mantio was the savior of the lost colony, and you know, and and so, but we just don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. Um, and, and what I think is really important to remember is if Manio was the savior of the lost colony, he, he didn't do it because he was pro-English, right? He did it because, you know, maybe because he's a good person, but also, you know, primarily because it fit with the objectives of his society, that taking in, you know, poor refugees was a value to them. Um, so there's this value in making connections with a powerful trading and military empire, but also there's a value in taking care of people who are in need, and, and that also fits with, uh, with what they might have done. But in none of that is it this, this sort of stereotype of him as like converting to being totally English and giving up on his own people. It's, it's if anything, it's the opposite of that. No, it's a truly humanistic kind of approach to, you know, to difference Right. Right. And, yeah. and that you find the shared humanity in people. Well, this has just been absolutely fascinating to learn about Mantio. Oh, show us one more time. Unfortunately, this neither of these are actually Mantio, but uh, we're going to we're going to say thank you to Mantio. And, and uh, I want to welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathleen. This has been absolutely uh, fascinating. I've learned so much. Um, and I know we'll have some questions. I think Abby has a question down here um, uh, about uh, did Mantio see anything of England outside of London? Yeah, so they come in, I think they come in at Portsmouth. Um, so he definitely gets a good view of um, sort of English shipping channels, right? And then actually Durham House, as you can see, is on the Thames. So you can see lots of things go by. There's a major road the, um, that's right behind the house. So 
Um, but 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 he sees urban and coastal England. He doesn't, uh, as far as I know, he doesn't um, go into the countryside at all. He gets so so Raleigh is using him also as a fundraiser. So he goes to the House of Commons. He goes mm -hmm. he goes to the castle where Elizabeth lives. It's not clear if she if he meets her or not. Um, but uh, uh, he sees a lot of London. Um, and its surroundings, but but not the countryside. So we, so we want to imagine that he's going to go to one of these small English villages and be like, ah, my people, you know? <laughs> right, but, right, exactly. Yeah, so he may not know the parallel that we made um, between English towns and his town. Yeah, it'd be so fast. I mean, it's just, of course, every historian wishes, why didn't you folks write all this stuff down for yes. us? You know? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> but, right. We know he's there for months and months. So, yeah, yeah. I think so, he sat uh, around the house a lot working on his language. <laughs> We have a question here from a distinguished uh, scholar of Native American history, Danny Bell, who asks, uh, does uh, UNC include the study of Mantio and the next 200 <laughs> years of Native colonist engagement in the curriculum? Yes, yeah, we do. So it's um, it's in uh, a variety of our classes in uh, our Native North American survey, our history of uh, certainly of the first half of US history, and I hope in the second half of U.S. history, they continue to talk about Native North Carolina um, and, uh, and um, um, in our smaller classes, including Eastern, um, like Native America, the East class, and, and we have alumni class that's taught as well. And in all of those, there's this connection that I think it's Danny Bell is pointing to that's so important between this distant past and the present, because I think one of the most important points to take home from this is you know, Manio isn't this like singular figure who has this English connection and that's all that makes him important. He is, uh, you know, his descendants still live here today and are um, part of our, the present of North Carolina and this distant past and all of that history in between. So, you know, but this, this, I, you know, the phrase Mantio to Murphy, I, people are, when are you going to do Murphy? You know, but, uh, you know, but this is, this is this sort of thing we hear all the time, Mantio to Murphy. Um, <laughs> right. I, you know, I just imagine that, you know, this is something that students come in and do they are, in general, are they surprised that Mantio as a person or are they already familiar with this concept? Um, with him as a person, obviously. Not yeah, person. no, I think a, if they've seen the play, The Lost Colony, they know because he's an important yeah. character in that. Um, but otherwise, Can I say, probably, admission, I've never seen the play. So okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's and I should say um, some of our colleagues here at UNC are working uh, with the Lost Colony play to um, rewrite it some, yeah. I think, and make it a little more in keeping with with the history that we should be telling. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I have a question about, do, you know, in terms of later Native Americans, are, do they make references to Mantio as an example, um, whether, uh, you know, a cautionary tale or a celebratory tale? And, and, and again, even beyond, because this is such a huge category, right? Native American, American Indian, there's, so does it, cross, does it become general, does this story become generalized into some sense of the exchange between European and Native American? Yeah, I really don't know. I'm Danny Bell could probably answer that better than I could. Um, I'm not sure. I and I, you know, I must say that one of the reasons I chose Manio instead of Juan Chis is because of the town, because I knew people would know mm -hmm. either either who he was or that they should know who he was. Whereas um, Juan Chis is just as important in this story. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm. It, it I mean, it may be a little bit like uh, you know, there are these figures like. Um, probably like Manios or like Pocahontas who are just, they take up sometimes one individual who makes it into the European record can take up so much space yeah. um, in the popular imagination that I think, you know, I think a lot of Native people would say, please don't think that that is the whole story, um, either of that time or all the time since. Um, and I think, an, yeah, another, you know, is just so important to look at the, the, the connection to the present um, and that the Algonquin speaking and Iroquoian speaking peoples of this region are still around today. Yeah, sure. And I think all of the times we have one individual person, it's the burden for them to represent everything that they come from, you know, and, and, and that's just not, that's not fair to them as individuals and as people. And it also doesn't really show much respect for where they come from, you know, like a, the, right. the culture that, that there's right. a diversity exactly. in those, there's a diversity in every culture and there's a diversity mm -hmm. in all people. And it makes us feel good that we can take one person and have them be the essence of another people. 
Yeah, right, right, right. And yeah. make it sanitized for to fit very much in uh, in in something that makes us feel good about the ult ultimate complete degradation of Native American society that we are, you know, unfortunately. But not complete, right? Because not, that's why Native complete. nations are still here no, today. No, actually, please, please, forgive me um, right. for the, you know, severe, let me just put it that, severe right. degradation right. of these Native American societies as they were before European contact. Right, yeah. So, yeah. Let um, me, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to put a link in the chat that is yeah, to, this is something that the research lab, labs of archaeology have done here at UNC, and it's, um, They've kind of put together John White's map and, and towns that were on the map with ways you can drive there. And so you can actually drive around Eastern North Carolina and see where, um, where these towns were that the English visited, but that were clearly important native towns. At the time. This is amazing. You're saying I'm going to get out of this bedroom at some point. Yes, someday. someday. And I think we'll be in cars maybe before we're in airplanes and trains. So, uh, yeah, so sure. a driving trip might be just the thing for late spring. <laughs> well, I want to first, I'm going to bring up again the, the, the picture of not Mantio to thank Mantio for joining us. Thank you, Mantio, for joining us. Um, and uh, you are an absolutely fascinating figure. And I hope that we've done you justice. Our, our stranger who is no longer a stranger. And uh, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, can you hear the applause? Uh, everyone, please thank Dr. Kathleen Duval. Uh, fantastic historian. Tell us what your next work is on. Tell everybody what we can expect to see in your scholarship. Yes, yeah, so my next book is, is a long history of Native North America from um, basically from the 1100s through the 19th century and into the 20th and 21st centuries to make some of these big points about the continuity, the long-term population and yeah. power of Native peoples. One of the chapters will be on Osamokamuk, this place, and, and Manio's role, among others, within it. Um, each chapter will deal with a different place and time across that long, and people, peoples across that long time period. Well, I got, thank you. I want to give a shout out to Independence Lost, too. Just a fantastic book um, that really makes us rethink the entire American Revolution uh, by situating Native Americans and other cultures in that story. So, Kathleen, so great to see you. Perhaps next time I see you, it'll be in 3D. Yeah, that would be we can wonderful. Only hope, and maybe even <laughs> unmasked like this. Right. But at any rate, so thank Someday. you for joining Thank you for joining us. Um, I want to thank all of our guests who have come. I want to thank Paul Bonici behind the scenes, all of our sponsors. Go to humanities.unc.edu for more information. This evening, we have still have room in our seminar on religious freedom, and I'll be the first person talking about religious freedom in France, a very different topic. But guess what? We still have a lot of the same issues. So uh, we uh, please join us. Go to humanities.unc.edu. Follow us on Facebook and also go to YouTube where you'll find a lot of our materials, including previous iterations of Lunch with Friends and Strangers. One more time, put our hands together for Kathleen Duvall. Yay. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. <laughs>